Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations about art, literature, and creativity. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 123. Today's guest is Gabrielle Bates. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. This week, I'm pleased to bring you our next KTCO book club conversation. This time, I'm talking with poet Gabrielle Bates. Gabrielle Bates is a writer and visual artist originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, Virginia Quarterly Review, New England Review, Jubilat, Gulf Coast, Mississippi Review, Black Warrior Review, The Best of the Net Anthology, and Bax, Best American Experimental Writing. And her poetry comics have been featured internationally in a variety of exhibitions, festivals, and conferences. Formerly the managing editor of the Seattle Review and a contributing editor for Poetry Northwest, Gabrielle currently serves as the social media manager of Open Books, a poem emporium, a contributing editor for Bull City Press, and a University of Washington teaching fellow. She also volunteers as a poetry mentor through the Adroit Teen Mentorship Program and teaches occasionally as a spotlight author through Seattle's Writers in the Schools. With Luther Hughes and Dujit Hahat, she co-hosts the podcast The Poet Salon. I'll just mention here that I've been an avid listener of The Poet Salon for the past couple of years. It's one of my favorite literary shows out there, and it's how I became introduced to Gabby Bates and her work. The conversations that Gabby and her co-hosts have on The Poet Salon have what I think is the perfect balance of profundity and energy, of intellectual rigor and fun, the kinds of conversations that you'd imagine at like a lively dinner party with the smartest people you know. So I, of course, was really excited to talk with Gabby about a book she loves and find out what she'd pick. And what she picked for us today was Bridget Pegeen Kelly's 1994 poetry collection, Song. Song is the second of Kelly's three collections, and the poems are, for me, kind of hard to describe. What I can say for sure is that these poems are slippery and layered, often kind of surreal, but grounded, which I understand seems like a contradiction, but somehow it manages to be true. In any case, I'm grateful to Gabby for introducing me to this book. Quick note before we start, there are links in the show notes to where you can purchase your own copy of Song. I encourage you, of course, to buy from your own local independent bookstore, but if you haven't got one of those, I've included links to Open Books in Seattle and to the Book Catapult here in San Diego. There's also a link to The Poet Salon. I give that my highest recommendation. And finally, if you're a fan of this book or of Kelly's work in general, tweet us your thoughts using the hashtag KTCO Book Club. Okay, let's get started. Here's my conversation with Gabrielle Bates about Bridget Pegeen Kelly's song. I wanted to thank you for picking this book. I, you know, I wasn't familiar with her work before. And so this, this was sort of my introduction to her work. And it's not like really anything else I've read before, but so sort of where I wanted to start was to ask you, well, sort of a twofold question. One, sort of what was it that made you want to pick this book as the book that you wanted to talk about for our conversation? But sort of more broadly also, because I think, you know, I've seen you talk about this book on Twitter before, and I get the impression that this is a book that you have returned to many times, that you have sort of a long history with. And, you know, if we could sort of talk about your history with the book as well, I would love to do that. How does that sound? Sounds incredible. And I don't think I could answer one of those questions without also touching on the other. So I'm glad you asked them interwovenly. Song by Bridget Pegeen Kelly came into my life in my very first poetry workshop in graduate school. I had a professor who noticed quite accurately that I was very uncomfortable reading poems out loud. It made me incredibly anxious. And he sought to <laughs> cure me of this anxiety by asking me to read out loud to the class a lot. And one day he handed me the poem, the title poem from this book, Song, and asked me to read it to the class. And I remember more than any poem I'd ever read before, I disappeared into it. There was something about the music and the story and those long lines. There was something about it that I was able to disappear into. It was like becoming a conduit of 
some kind in a way that I'd never really experienced before. And I sought out the book after that. And the whole book was like that for me. I would never experienced anything like it. The world that it built was one I just knew I would be returning to live in again and again for the rest of my life. And, you know, that has been true for the years that followed that moment. It's hard for me to talk about in a way which is funny that I chose it to talk about, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I guess that gives us a bit of a starting point. I think Bridget Pig and Kelly and I share a lot of obsessions too. That's definitely something that I connect with, this obsession with animals, with a juxtaposition of childhood and adulthood, religious themes that run through. I feel like we're connected at the level of the soul, this poet and me in a way that I, I haven't experienced really with any other poet. That word, the phrase that you used a minute ago, you said the world that she builds in this collection. And so far, this is the only, she's got three books and I've only read just this one so far. I'm sure I will go, go back and read the other ones when I have a chance because these, this was so interesting. But the, at least in the context of this collection, there is, I think, this sense of a world being built. I think that's a very apt way of putting it, which is, you know, very clearly in many ways, it is the world that all of us live in, but it doesn't feel quite the same as the world that we live in. There's something sort of strange in it, where even though most of the things that she's describing are things that are familiar, or at least pointing to things that are familiar, but they're described in this way, whether whether it's through the metaphor or sort of this sort of surreal quality that a lot of the imagery has, it makes the ordinary feel strange. A lot of these poems were like profoundly unsettling to me, which I, I found a really interesting experience. You, you know what I mean? Yes. Profoundly unsettling is an incredible description of Bridget Piggy and Kelly's style, I think. There's this extravagant moral authority, this like immense thickness of description, which, yeah, it's like she could be applying her eye to anything, to, you know, this glass of water on the table. And just by virtue of the way she describes things, it would become mythical mm. and terrifying. And so beautiful, you could just weep. I, it's really, I think, yeah, her way of, of describing that is one of the most singular attributes of her poems and, and what allows for that unsettling response that I think everyone feels. Yeah, I feel like so much poetry that sort of, sort of takes on a, or embodies a certain pastoral setting has to it a certain quality of like longing or nostalgia or comfort to it right but there is just not that here. <laughs> no, not at all and it's no. it's funny too because i feel like it's not like she's rejecting this exactly because i feel like when i read these poems i feel like the speaker of the poems has a comfort in her own place in this world, but just that the world is not a comforting place. Does that, I don't know if that's quite right, but that's sort of the impression that I come away with. Yeah, the idea of comfort is so fascinating in relation to this book. Because while I, I don't sense really any comfort in it, I do sense a lot of lullaby mm. in it. I think Bridget Piggy and Kelly's role as a mother with her attention to boys and girls and children is deeply felt in the book, but it, it is not, it is not comforting really in the sense that I, I understand that word, but it is attentive mm. to the pain and suffering and weirdness of being young and being vulnerable and so in that sense, it is in a way comforting. Hmm. And the music, the music in these poems is comforting in a way. It rocks me. It lulls me. And so, and so there is, 
like a womb-like comfort in some ways. I'm reminded a little bit of the, the first conversation I had with Maggie Smith on the show when we were talking about her collection, Good Bones, and how she, I mean, obviously Maggie Smith's work is very, very different from uh, Bridget Pekin Kelly's work, but that, you know, I remember talking to her about how she has this sense of a lot of her poems are sort of engaging with um, the way that the world can be a dark place, but often what they're about or what they're immediately about, what they're depicting is has a sort of softness to it as well. And that's not exactly what I am feeling here, but what's similar in both of these cases, I was reminded when I was talking of, to her, and I was reminded again when I was reading this, that, um, so this is going to be a second or third hand quotation at this point. So there's a line in the photographer Sally Mann's autobiography, which is called Hold Still. Sally Mann is sort of a problematic figure in the world of photography, but um, for a number of reasons, but she's a really excellent writer. And there's this point when she's using a quotation from, I think, Flaubert to describe sort of how she sees the world, where he's talking about how he can never look at a beautiful woman without thinking about the fact that there is like a skeleton inside her that someday she will be just a skeleton under the earth. And that that is something that drives her photography, like how when she looks at her children, that's something that she thinks about for them. And that is something here that I feel like there is this sense where there are these engagements with motherhood or with childhood. And in a way that there is a softness of regard, perhaps, but always with this awareness that there is a darkness to life as well, which is also something that I end up thinking about my kids a lot too. But you know what I mean? It's like, I can see where there is a comfort to it at sort of tenderness, but it's also very much engaged with this sense of finality, you know, which I find unsettling personally. <laughs> yeah, I think so many of us do. It's, yeah, the comfort of honesty, not the comfort of the lie. Mm. You know, she's not going to say, oh, you're going to be okay. You're going to live forever because you're scared of dying. She's going to say, yes, you're dying. And let me rock you <laughs> until you feel like you can walk again. This book is so haunted by mortality, by cruelty, by the shadow that comes along with the heart. One of the things I love about this book is how much she uses the word heart, mm. which I would be so scared to you know use that word very much in poems because it can come off saccharine or unserious. But the way she treats it, she treats the heart, the soul so seriously with such regard it is, you know, throughout this book, the heart is a bird. It is something separate from the self that is watched and obsessed over. And it is something inside, something interior. It's clearly something that, that she was really obsessed with. Well, I can't think about hearts in this without thinking about the title poem. And of course, I can't actually think about the collection without thinking about the title poem. It is the first poem and like I said, this book was my introduction to her work. And so because I read it in order, this this poem was the first of hers that I'd read, which I, I gather may not be terribly unusual because it is a hell of a poem. What do you think about, like, would you be willing to read the first poem? Yes, I think I must read it. I think <laughs> everyone everyone needs to hear it before we say anything else. But I say that, but I, I do want to say... um from the little I know of Kelly, you know, she was an intensely private person, so there's very little known about her. But one of the few things I do know is that she was not a fan of her first book, mm. To the Place of Trumpets, which won the Yale First Book Prize when she was in her late 30s. And she requested that it be taken out of print. She disliked it so much. So I think she would be pleased that you your first foray into her work was with her second book, with mm. this one. Song. Listen. There was a goat's head hanging by ropes in a tree. All night it hung there and sang. And those who heard it 
felt a hurt in their hearts, and they thought they were hearing the song of a night bird. They sat up in their beds, and then they lay back down again. In the night wind, the goat's head swayed back and forth, and from far off it shone faintly, the way the moonlight shone on the train track miles away, beside which the goat's headless body lay. Some boys had hacked its head off. It was harder work than they had imagined. The goat cried like a man and struggled hard. But they finished the job. They hung the bleeding head by the school and then ran off into the darkness that seems to hide everything. The head hung in the tree. The body lay by the tracks. The head called to the body. The body to the head. They missed each other. The missing grew large between them until it pulled the heart right out of the body, until the drawn heart flew toward the head, flew as a bird flies back to its cage and the familiar perch from which it trills. Then the heart sang in the head, softly at first and then louder sang long and low until the morning light came up over the school and over the tree, and then the singing stopped. The goat had belonged to a small girl. She named the goat Broken Thorn Sweet Blackberry, named it after the night's bush of stars, because the goat's silky hair was dark as well water because it had eyes like wild fruit. The girl lived near a high railroad track. At night, she heard the trains passing, the sweet sound of the train's horn pouring softly over her bed. And each morning she woke to give the bleeding goat his pail of warm milk. She sang him songs about girls with ropes and cooks in boats. She brushed him with a stiff brush. She dreamed daily that he grew bigger, and he did. She thought her dreaming made it so. But one night, the girl didn't hear the train's horn, and the next morning she woke to an empty yard. The goat was gone. Everything looked strange. It was as if a storm had passed through while she slept. Wind and stones, rain stripping the branches of fruit. She knew that someone had stolen the goat and that he had come to harm. She called to him. All morning and into the afternoon, she called and called. She walked and walked. In her chest, a bad feeling like the feeling of the stones gouging the soft undersides of her bare feet. Then somebody found the goat's body by the high tracks, the flies already filling their soft bottles at the goat's torn neck. Then somebody found the head hanging in a tree by the school. They hurried to take these things away so that the girl would not see them. They hurried to raise money to buy the girl another goat. They hurried to find the boys who had done this, to hear them say it was a joke, a joke. It was nothing but a joke. But listen, here is the point. The boys thought to have their fun and be done with it. It was harder work than they had imagined, this silly sacrifice, but they finished the job, whistling as they washed their large hands in the dark. What they didn't know was that the goat's head was already singing behind them in the tree. What they didn't know was that the goat's head would go on singing just for them.
long after the ropes were down and that they would learn to listen, pail after pail, stroke after patient stroke. They would wake in the night thinking they heard the wind in the trees or a night bird, but their hearts beating harder. There would be a whistle, a hum, a high murmur, and at last, a song. The low song a lost boy sings, remembering his mother's call. Not a cruel song, no, no, not cruel at all. This song is sweet, it is sweet. The heart dies of this sweetness. <laughs> I, I mean, I probably read this 10 times in the past couple of weeks and it just, it just never, it never stops hitting the way that it hits, you know, like even as it becomes more familiar, it doesn't become necessarily easier. I thought a lot about this poem since I first read it and thinking about how I wanted to talk to you about the collection and talk to you about this poem of all of the poems in this book, this is my favorite. It's also the one that I think about the most. It's the one that sort of interestingly is one of the easier ones for me to get my arms around. You know, like a lot of the poems in this collection are very challenging. They're kind of opaque. And this one, it's not that there isn't opacity to it, but it's one of the mo most narrative of all of the poems in the book. And so I feel like that, that narrative sort of gives me a way in that in some of the other poems, it's not given away. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot about how this poem provides an entry into the rest of the collection, how it's doing things that provide a sort of touchstone for understanding other parts of the collection, but then also how it's different from most of the rest of the poems in this collection. The story is so much more straightforward, but even as it is very surreal in this question of, of what is real and what is not, what is symbol and what is not meant to be a symbol, you know, is sort of ringing through it and how there's repetition, how there is this cruelty from these boys and throughout the collection, boys tend to be this figure of sort of thoughtless cruelty that repeats over and over again, which is something that has this menace to it that is all the more menacing because you know it, you know, like, you know how boys can be like that. I mean, I, I, it's almost like there's so much happening here that you don't know where to start, you know? Yeah. I love what you said about being able to connect with this poem all the poems in this book for me, no matter how many times I read them, they activate. It's not like I'm reading them for the first time, but sometimes it is. There, So many of the poems in this book feel like dreaming in the way that when you're in it, it's extremely evocative. It feels real. I can be brought to literally to tears reading so many of these poems, but once I exit them, there's an interesting way that they dissipate. And I couldn't necessarily even recall a line or a central image from it in, in many of these poems, but then I re-enter it and it's the most overwhelming embodied experience. And I think this title poem that I just read is an exception to that because it is so thoroughly narrative. It's like watching a short film in a way. It's ingrained in my brain to where, you know, I can never forget it after one read, after 10 reads, after 20 reads. And yet, like you said, like it never stops working on you. Like I, when I just read it, I was incredibly moved. I was totally drawn into it again which is incredible. I think that title poem, Song, is such an incredible example of how a poet can build an entire world out of a single word, out of a single word's history. And for this poem, you know, I think about the word tragedy, which comes from 
the Greek tragos for goat and oide for song, quite literally goat song is the word tragedy. And I feel like this poem can be read as a world conjured out of that one word, which blows my mind. <laughs> and, you know, that's, you know, what, you know, so many poets do. We're obsessed with language. We're obsessed with the magic and the worlds that hide in the history of words. Mm -hmm. And I see across this book, an obsession, not only with what hides within a single word, but, you know, what hides within colloquialisms or certain nursery rhymes, these scraps of language that surround us all the time. Poets like Kelly see more in them. They're able to go through them like a portal into this dark, strange, whole other world with entire stories and casts of characters. It's mind boggling, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about, I mean, I don't know where you grew up, how you grew up. For me, I, I grew up in a fairly small, uh, woodsy little town in Northern California. And, you know, now I live in one of the largest cities in the United States. And, you know, I remember when I went away to college, people talking about small towns in this way that it made it really obvious that they'd never spent any amount of time <laughs> in a small town. How, you know, so many people, whether it's in the movies or the way politicians talk about small towns, there's this sort of idyllic quality to the small town in the American imagination. And yet, I mean, people are people everywhere. And so all of the same cruelties and smallnesses and menace that exists in a city or anywhere exists in the small town too. And that is like so front and center here. But at the same time, that idyllic quality also exists in this poem, you know, like in the way that this unnamed girl cares for the goat, who is the only being in the poem that actually has a name, the tenderness with which she names this goat, takes care of it, dreams it into growing. I mean, it's just so soft. It's so beautiful. It's so gentle. And yet, because this has already come after we know the goat has had its head taken off, like it's reading it is just like you use the word tragedy. It is tragic and it's sad. The way that the poem moves from this sort of cruelty to tenderness back to cruelty and then back to a kind of tenderness again is just breathtaking. When I was sort of researching for this conversation, I, I read a piece by Jean Anne Verlee in Muzzle Magazine, who's several years old at this point, where she was talking about this poem and the way that that piece ends. I'm just going to read the ending of it, the last paragraph. She says, Once a friend showed me a poem about magic, a poem about loss, a beautiful poem about the brutal suffering of poetic bodies, a sweet goat who cried and struggled, a girl who loved a whole love and lost her love to a grisly stunt, a poem about grief, the fracture of irreparable grief, a poem where a heart can fly as a bird in the night sky, where the massacred sing and go on singing, where the tormentors learn to listen. Once a sweet goat's severed head reminded me how to sing, how to haunt. That line about the tormentors learning to listen, I hadn't thought of that when I read the poem the first four or five times. And then when I read this, I was really just kind of crushed by it. Um, because it's so unexpected, I realized that she's right, how amazing and how unusual that learning is. And yet they do. Oh, man, I just, I, I mean, this, this poem just flattens me. <laughs> yeah. One of the many magics of this poem for me is, you know, obviously the vast majority of my empathy and my sadness go to the girl and the slaughtered goat. But what's really incredible is how I feel you know, sorry for these boys by the end, too, and like tender towards them, towards the perpetrators of this really horrific violence you know they are haunted by the song forever they didn't really know what they were doing their children at the mercy of you know this messed up world and the way we all are 
and I just think the, the expansiveness of of heart and yeah that like creepy tenderness even towards them that we're left with you know no one escapes this poem unscathed yeah. <laughs> uh, we're all kind of brutalized by it and and held by it you brought up place and small towns and it reminded me that you know to me despite the fact that to my knowledge she never lived in the south kelly will always be a southern poet to me the god haunted baroque style the richly layered narratives that braid together ugliness and beauty the sacred and the profane the fecundity of the description in regards to the land and animals and human interactions between land and animals how you can feel the thickness of the air and the night in these worlds to me it's southern to me it's mm. deeply southern and and as a southern poet myself it's a way that i connect i grew up in birmingham alabama i live in seattle now but the deep south will always be the landscape of my poetics i think and um I wish Bridget Piggy and Kelly was alive so I could talk with her about the South and Southernness and see if there's a connection there that I don't know. But, you know, regardless, I think the aesthetic can be read that way in conversation with the literature that comes out of that particular place. One of the things that always strikes me about when I visit different regions of the United States is how, you know, each place has its own sort of unique character. But there is also something that is what I can recognize in like a medium-sized town in Western Virginia is not terribly dissimilar to what I can recognize, you know, wandering around the woods in the forest near, you know, outside of my town where I grew up in Northern California. I think you're right to say that there's a quality, and I want to say, I mean, maybe this is like too facile a word, but like the sort of gothic quality that um, we associate with Southern writers feels very present here. And we don't necessarily feel that in the same way with writers that are associated with the Northeast or the Midwest or California or whatever, it, which always kind of strikes me as interesting because it, it's like when I will read a Southern writer describing things about the landscape, I feel like I recognize the landscape from where I'm from. It's just that people don't write about my landscape in the same way. And I always sort of wondered why that is, you know? And so like Bridget Piggy and Kelly, I believe was born in California, but lived most of her life in the Midwest. But why should it be that if there are these qualities that are the same about the landscape there and here and in the South, why shouldn't those qualities come out in the writing? You know what I mean? It's weird. It's so weird. Yeah, I was a little squeamish to even share that take about her and Southernness because how absurd in a way to argue, you know, someone's aesthetics are based in a place that they are not based. But I think it does have so much more to do with sensibility and attention than it does with your literal surroundings. Mm. It's, it's a way of looking more than it is what you're looking at. Mm. Like, you know, so much of the scenes and objects and whatnot that we get across this book really could be anywhere. They're graveyards, they're, you know, small antique shops, they're any place where there's a house near train tracks, you know, that could be so many places, but it's in the way that she handles these things that to me feels in line with a Southern tradition or aesthetic yeah. in some ways. I mean, there is that sort of haunted quality that I do feel like is, I don't know, if I read Faulkner or something, Faulkner always has that sort of haunted quality that I don't feel in the same way from other sort of, you know, writers that are associated strongly with the geographic region of the United States. I don't feel it in the same way. As you say, I think it's like more the person and how you're looking rather than what you're looking at. So I guess I wonder what it is about a person that would draw them to looking in that way, you know? Yeah, this is, you know, a stereotype, which I want to be careful about. But I think maybe it's more 
about rural versus city in terms of pacing. I think there's a, you know, a slowness of attention and time that's clear in the poems and song. These are not rushed descriptions. These are not little things, snippets jotted in a notebook on a busy commute in New York City. You know, this is a, a landscape where someone is really spending time and watching and watching the transformation of even like a still object. And I think there's something about pace in relationship to certain types of landscapes and certain types of places where there is more nature surrounding, where you can't get from A to B as quickly, that maybe has something to do with a certain type of literature that tends to be written there. I don't want to be, you know, overly essentialist about it, but that would make sense to me Yeah, if there was a connection. And in particular, I think there's something about the particular landscape that Kelly is talking about here and how it's like seasons play so much of a, a role in the descriptions and in the way the sense of time passing, of course, time being very fluid in many of these poems where, um, you know, I'm thinking of the White Pilgrim poem where, you know, yeah. it's summer and then all of a sudden it's winter, it's summer again, it's winter. It's kind of both at the same time. That's a feature of the landscape that uh, my landscape does not particularly have in common. But yeah, this sense of, I want to not be talking too much out of my butt here, but <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like there is a, like a sense of rootedness and sort of connection to the earth or not even earth, but like earthiness mm -hmm. and landscape, but not as land. I don't know if that quite makes mm -hmm. sense. Like I'm going to, I'm going to reach a little bit here. Reach. So where I'm from is uh, up in Monterey County. And my wife and I are both from that area. She grew up in Big Sur, which is a place that's obviously known for its landscape, mountains going right into the ocean. And I grew up in a valley that was, you know, maybe half an hour away in, you know, a small little valley, right? So I was used to oak trees, sort of rolling hills, a river going through it, and then these dramatic coastlines. And I remember, so right after college, we moved to... Orange County, so outside of Los Angeles. And Orange County is a very flat and very urban suburban. And I remember saying to her, you know, I like it fine here. I mean, I don't really like it that much. I don't know if I like the people. But the thing that really gets me is that the land doesn't sing here. Where where we were from, I felt like the land sang. And I feel like there's something like that here where you know, it's not like like in Steinbeck where like the land is like a character, right? It's not like that. And it's not even necessarily like a definite presence, but there is something about this spirit of the land that's not exactly the same as the trees or the birds that she so often pays attention to, other facets of the natural world, but that there is almost something deeper than that, like something about the the earth turning and the seasons changing and there being this connection between the literal ground and time and life that just sort of, I feel like the poems are kind of haunted by. Um, th does, that, does that strike you as? <laughs> yes, I love that. I love so much of what you just said and described. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was gorgeous. Um, the, where the land sings. I'm reminded of something that Ada Limon said on the podcast that I co-host, The Poet Salon, recently about how she goes to poetry when she's having trouble hearing music in the world. When mm -hmm. there's a music in the world, she's having trouble hearing. And I feel like Kelly is a poet who reminds me or instructs me in how to hear the music and the world wherever I am you know it's not like I must go to wherever her farm is in the Midwest in order to hear the music there's just a way that she attends to the world around her that draws that music out in a way that we can all hear it I'm so interested in yeah you mentioned the poem the white pilgrim old Christian cemetery and that poem stands out to me in this book as being a much more sort of frenetic pace and so it makes sense that it would incorporate 
you know, more than one season, more than one time of day. It's really, um, it's, it's moving quicker. It's got like really short sentences. It's moving faster than a lot of the other poems in the book. And in that poem, I just have to shout out these lines. The dead keep working. If you listen, you can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Like, is that not Southern? Is that not straight out of Faulkner? But um, <laughs> if you listen to the landscape to wherever you are, like the dead are talking to you. Mm -hmm. It uh, it sort of reminds me of that famous Faulkner line that everybody's quoting lately about how the past isn't past. It's, mm -hmm. you, are you, right. I can't, yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about not just the imagery, not just the repeating themes, although like those are things that come to me a lot when I think about these poems. But But I wanted to talk a little bit about something, I'm just going to say it, I want to talk about the colons. Yes, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about the colons in this book. <laughs> so uh, partially this is on my mind because I have just recently been reading and talking with Carrie Wason. And colons were on my mind with her because of the fact that she, her poetry uses a lot of M dashes. And she talked about this in, in a different interview with Kenyon Review, where she, and she sort of had like a almost a throwaway line about how she used to use a lot of colons, but now she uses a lot of M dashes, and that for her the she mentioned this thing about the word for M dash in German literally translating to thought mark, and the thing with the M dash, I often feel like in both cases the M dash and the colon are a sort of interruption and a sort of way of connecting two things that are not necessarily going to go together. But there's something different about the way that the colons work in this as compared to how Gary Wason uses the M dash. And I feel like it connects to how she uses metaphor and imagery in an interesting way. One example is in the, the poem Dead Doe, which is another one that really jumped out at me. I adore that poem. Oh, that poem makes me cry. Yeah. And there are a ton of colons in this. The first line starts off with a colon. The doe lay dead on her back in a field of asters, colon, no. The doe lay dead on her back beside the school bus stop, colon, yes. And so here it's like an interruption. It's sort of like a correction, right? But as we go further in, and this happens all, all over the place in these poems where like one sentence will have a colon and then an, a, a fragment and then another colon and then a fragment and then another colon and a fragment. And I kept thinking about how here the colon is acting almost like a little doorway where you're being asked to go further in and then further in again and then further in again. And there is also a way that she does this with symbols and metaphors too, where many times she will start with an image and then use a metaphor or a simile to describe that image or feeling. And then that metaphor then becomes the foundation of a new image that then she describes that with a new metaphor. And she'll go several layers in, like, like I'm thinking of in the poem, The Column of Mercury, uh, recording the temperature of night, she has no sleep being this figure that is walking back and forth in a wolf suit, but the, like a train. But then the train itself becomes something that makes a, a flute-like sound and is going past the hospital. And then the flute becomes, the sound of a flute becomes a thing. And we just get further and further and further into these layers of metaphor. There aren't a lot of colons in that particular poem, but I feel like there's this connection between the way that she uses these like you know, like Inception, like the movie Inception, where it's like layers and layers and layers. And I feel like both the colons and her use of layers of metaphor are doing something similar. And it, it really, I don't know, it took me several readings to sort of get to this point with it. Because at first I was just like, what is happening here? It was unexpected. But it's very rewarding to to sort of come to the point where you kind of feel like you can see how this thing is working. And that's something that I feel like with the more quote unquote accessible form wouldn't necessarily give you that same experience. You know what I mean? I love that interpretation of the colon as the sort of like small signifier of the layering work that she's doing metaphorically across the book and how both metaphor and the colon is a kind of doorway. I was going to say, 
to the extent that an M dash feels to me like a bridge, a colon feels more to me like a portal. Like there's less mm. of that walking across to get from A to B, you're just kind of there. But both of those forms of punctuation imply to me multi-directionality, like what comes before also comes after, like the, the information can kind of be flipped in a way, mm. both the M dash and the colon signify that to me. But, um, oh, I think that's just so brilliant what you said about how the, the colon is working syntactically is in a way how the metaphors and images are working across the book and amassing these layers, amassing this depth, taking you somewhere entirely unexpected and new, but from the same starting point in a way. In Dead Doe, the colons are doing something so fascinating. The way the poem begins, which I'm so glad you read, it reminds me of a polygraph test. It's like, <laughs> is this true or, or false? And like, there's like a test being taken or something, you know, like, to what extent is this image true? Is something that the, the speaker of the poem is wrestling with. And it's just so fascinating. Yeah, those colons, they're so unexpected. When I think of punctuation across this book that is weird or that grabs my attention, I think of the ellipses, actually. I'm so glad that you pointed out the colons, but for me, it's much more unexpected, just like how often she uses ellipses. Like, I don't know any other poet that uses ellipses as frequently mm. as she does. It's almost a faux pas in so much contemporary poetry to use them even once, but she just really leans in, and I respect that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, the colons are brilliant too. The ellipses too, I feel like there's a way in which both the colons and the ellipses are doing a thing where the colons, like when there's re repeated colons, it isn't doing this so much. But like in the first few lines of Dead Doe or in the first line of Song, where she's in Dead Doe, the colon is giving you sort of like a correction, right? Or a comment on what comes before. In the first line of Song, she says, listen, right? It's like a command. And I feel like there are, like I'm thinking about the, the ellipses in All Wild Animals Were Once Called Deer. There's a lot of ellipses in that. That's another poem that sort of stands out to me for how narrative it is. But unlike song, this one, it feels like a person talking to me, right? Like instead of it being a story on a page, it feels like this person, the speaker of the poem is telling me a story in the moment. And so the ellipses are like, you can feel feel the speaker sort of stopping to think. And it feels much more like speech, like spoken word. And in that poem too, there are also moments, again, where I feel like this happens at several points. I can't remember every single poem it happens in where the speaker is correcting themselves. You get the sense that in the same way that if a person, like if you and I are telling each other a story right now in the moment, I might not remember something quite right. And then I might go back and say, oh, actually, actually, it was in, you know, 94, not in 97 or whatever, right? And the speaker of this poem and a few other poems do, does that too, where, I don't know, it does something, it makes it feel more intimate, maybe. And also, like in a weird way, I don't know if this is how it works in your reading, but in a weird way, highlighting the fact that the speaker's memory is untrustworthy makes the speaker feel more trustworthy to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like she's being honest with you about the missteps so that you trust her more. That makes sense to yeah. me. Yeah. It's very, it's kind of like magic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is magic. And I think that's the ambition of so many poets is to enact the mind's movement on the page truthfully by using artifice, it like doesn't mm. make sense. It's a sort of paradox that feels magical because there's this distillation of thought that is not exactly how the thought came out, but it, it feels like it is. I Yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it's a kind of magic for me as well. And I love, you know, what you said about the intimacy that's conjured by the ellipses, like being allowed in to those gaps, those trailings off that so often happen in like a real person-to-person -person conversation that normally in the space of something like a poem, 
you would edit out. But by evoking that with a piece of punctuation, she's allowing for a layer of intimacy. I feel like there are most of the time you said like made a reference to the the the, the ellipsis being kind of passe or whatever. Like you know you wouldn't do that now. And I feel like most of the time, if I saw an ellipsis, it, it'd be like getting an email from my father-in-law. You know, like yes. I would just be like, "Why? Why is this here?" Whereas, you know, the thing that you just said about artifice, the thing that is so striking about the way that the ellipses and and really this sort of spoken quality, conversational quality of the poems is that one doesn't imagine that in the writing of these poems that they were just like written down in the moment. Right. I mean, they're almost everybody who writes a poem is going to labor over it, you know, and make very conscious choices about, you know, where to break the lines, what exact words to use, what punctuation to put where, but especially poems like that one, like all wild animals were once called deer. There is this sort of quality where it feels not effortless is the wrong word, but you kind of know what I'm getting at where it doesn't feel like something that was labored over. It feels like something that someone just said, you know? Yeah. I don't know how she pulls that off because it's simultaneously so obviously worked over and wrought. I mean, so many of the poems, the lines and the line endings are so regularly sturdy. The music is clearly like so rot and you know even just seeing like physically on the page stanzas of very similar shape like this was clearly a like meticulously crafted poem you know across the book that applies to many of them and yet you're exactly right there's this way that there's this natural cadence this intimate an i speaking to a you often that doesn't feel overly premeditated or overly revised it's that magic pairing of those two facts that's wild yeah. so one of the things that we talked about very briefly towards the beginning of the conversation was you know that i had admitted that you know i found many of these poems to be fairly opaque and in particular it was interesting to start the collection off with song which i was able to dive into very deeply, very quickly. And then immediately the next poem is of Royal Issue where I just felt like I kind of bounced off it. And I've read that three or four times now too. And I always feel like I just bounce off of that one, which is not to say that I like, it's a little frustrating to me because I feel like I read a poem like that. And this happens at several points throughout the collection. I read this poem and I can tell that there is something going on mm. and I have no idea what it is. Mm. And this is going to be a little, well, this is going to date me a little bit. One of the things I was thinking about is, so, I mean, this is something that people have mentioned a lot um, when I was reading reviews or commentary about this book in particular, or about Kelly's poetry in, in general, that people will talk about uh, how she arrives at meaning or meaning being, um, there was a quote that was a particularly good one that I, that I liked from Amelia Phillips did a reading of song for the sundress blog and then when they were talking about it she said that it she'd have to say that kelly reminds her of standing on a windy hill where the wind fills one's ears and seems to carry snatches of meaning but they dissolve quite quickly mm. which i thought was great and it was reminding me a little bit of when we talked about carrie wason's poetry via email a few weeks ago where i kind of felt like at times it was like listening to something through a door I could have some sort of sense of it, but I wanted to open the door to get it a clearer sense of things. And one of the things that suddenly, like the third or fourth time I read through some of these poems occurred to me is when I was in high school in uh, the early 1990s, and everybody was listening to Nirvana and how everybody listened to Nirvana and nobody had a goddamn clue what any of those songs were about, but we all still loved them. And I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes. I think a, a poet like Kelly, and also I'm so glad that you got to chat with Carrie Wason. I think she's so brilliant and I love her work. 
but I think the connection between yeah listening to an album of music that you love where you you can't even like understand maybe what the person is saying at all and yet you love it um, is such a good comparison for so many poets but for a poet like Kelly who who writes from the ear first I believe it really is like listening to a piece of music and like listening to a piece of music if you like it if you're interested in it you're gonna listen to it again and again and again and the experience is the listening and in poetry so much of it is reading it out loud to allow that music to activate in your throat in in the air i think there's a way that you know reading a poem like of royal issue is going to reward you a lot more if you read it out loud or get someone to read it to you and I think it's absolutely true. I mean, you described kind of like running up against it and bouncing off of it or, um, you know, how I, I was describing earlier on in our conversation about how many of these poems feel like a dream and that they do kind of dissipate, like you were just quoting from that piece, like on the wind, scattered in the wind. They're both immersive and evocative and embodied and incredibly ephemeral. And, and this is one of those poems. I mean, it's so interesting. I can see the lines I've underlined in my copy, but I, I really think I would have to like read the whole poem again to re-remember what the experience of that poem is, what its texture and atmosphere and feeling is, um, because it's not nearly as narrative a song that comes right before it. I always think about how I mean, there was a point at which I remember when my friends and I, or my friends and I didn't talk about music so much, but when I would listen to <laughs> the other kids talking about music when I was in like 10th grade or something and, and everybody was talking about Nirvana all the time and people would have these theories about what does this line mean? Do you think, or what does that line mean? And some people would be like, it doesn't mean anything. It's just like in there. Cause it like sounds good or whatever. And how at the time people were just constantly speculating about what was on Kurt Cobain's mind. To some degree, I wonder mm -hmm. if it even matters, but then I kind of feel like it does. And I feel, I get a similar thing mm -hmm. with, with these poems where I feel like there is a moment being explored or explicated that the sort of density of the poetry to me indicates that this was an actual moment that really did happen, which I, again, like, I don't know mm. if that's necessarily important. We always talk about how like, it doesn't like, what is the realness of a, of a work of art? What is the truth of a work of art? Does it matter if it's factual? I don't think it really does matter if it's factual, mm. but I, I just get this feeling that like, there's some core to these poems that did happen, whether it was a moment mm. or an image or a feeling or something that, had a certain level of import to the poet and that there is this whole experience that's unfolding that I can't access, right? Because like in this poem, in, in Of Royal Issue, you know, you have these images of uh, birds on a plant and a boy doing something, not really completely clear what, and there's so much attention paid to these details and turning one thing into another. And I can't, at least like my thinking mind can't access what that experience was. And so it's hard for me to relate to it. And yet I feel like the fact that it was important to the poet makes it feel important to me, you know? And, and that is something that keeps mm -hmm. me curious about it. I don't know, like partially this is also just, I think my own the limitations of my own engagement with poetry, just because I can't help being an engineer about certain things. <laughs> These poems are kind of confounding to me, but in a way that like, I know there's something there and I just keep trying to immerse myself in them. When uh, other times when something, when I'm confounded, I just am like, well, okay, fuck this. And I'll go, well, go do something else. You know, you know what I mean? The desire to keep immersing. I love that. I think I love that so much more than, you know, returning to a riddle to like try to figure it out because I think so many of us are taught to read poetry as if they are all riddles to be solved and there's like this like secret answer and if you get it, haha, you win the poem and if you don't then you're a failure and you should feel ashamed. And I think 
I, I wish there was a lot more, you know, training is the wrong word, but um, instruction in reading poetry as an experience, as this pool of water that you're immersing yourself in, because we get so much training and how to read other texts with our, you know, intellectual capabilities to figure out how A connects to B, connects to C, that engineering brain that you mentioned. We get so much training and how to read that way and so little training and how to read for attention to the breath, to how repetition affects our body, to how images work flashing across the brain and connecting to other images, how to attend to atmosphere and texture. We get so little training in that. And so I think that leaves a lot of people feeling like they're quote bad at reading poetry and they're not. They're just, they're trying to read it like a different kind of text a lot of the time. I love that something about it, even if it's still very mysterious, is calling you back to want to immerse and experience again. I really do think that a poet's work is autobiographical to the extent that their imagination is their life. And I get the sense that Bridget Pagin Kelly had a very imaginative life. Like, I, I really do believe that she saw a lot of the impossible things that she describes mm. having seen, whether it was in a sleeping dream, a daydream, some sort of vision, I don't know, but the, just the, the accuracy of how these images feel and how she describes them and the, the deep feeling that comes along with it. I believe that she has seen these things. I believe that they are real to her even if it's as impossible as a heart flying out of a chest and entering a goat's head or something. And I think that's like the real litmus test is like, does it feel quote unquote real to you? Like, can you see it? Can you feel it? Then the, yeah, the, I believe there's like some kernel of, of autobiographical truth, but that doesn't also mean that it's not entirely imagined. One of the poems has like even has this directly in it. And I think it's the White Pilgrim Old Christian Cemetery again, where the speaker is talking about dreams. Says, yes, you know, yes. this was around the time of the dream. Dreams come from somewhere. There is this argument about nowhere, but it is not true. I dreamed that some boys knocked down all the stones in the cemetery, and then it happened. Yeah. And I feel like one of the things that I find kind of delightful, but also just kind of flummoxing, is how. I feel like there are certain points within a poem where the poem is not mainly a sort of meta poetic discussion where it's not exact it's not mainly a poem about the writing of a poem and yet there will be like one line in the middle of it like that one where it's like oh this is about a, writing a poem and it's just like sort of buried in there probably five or six times throughout the collection, there will be a line like that. I wish I had written them all down. I didn't, but where it feels like all of a sudden we're talking about what a poem is or where a poem comes from or what the process of writing a poem is. And then it'll just go on to something else. That is also something very unusual. I feel like more often when I, I read poems about art making, that's the main point of the poem, you know? And there's something, like I say, both delightful and kind of flummoxing about how it just sort of comes and goes so quickly in the middle of uh, something else, you know, almost yeah. like the same movement of thought that uh, that we were talking about before, where the poet is thinking about this, and then just briefly, the poet is thinking about this other thing, and then now we're back to the first thing again, that, yeah, like you were saying, it captures the texture of the the thought in a way that... I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but do you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Poets are obsessed with poetry. We can't help it. I think there's a way that every single poem in the world can be read as an ars poetica or as, you know, a poem about poetry and poem making, even if it's not overtly written that way. Um, I think we just can't help it. We're obsessed with language and how it works and how it makes meaning and the distance and overlaps between sound and sense. And we're just obsessed. We can't help it. Um, we're, we're obsessed with ourselves <laughs> and our, 
or art. But um, I, I mean, yes, there's a way that the line, you know, th- there is this argument about nowhere, but it is not true in regards to dreams can absolutely, you know, be applied to the world of the poem and poem writing. But also, we all have dreams, you know, whether we write poems or not. And, you know, anyone can wonder about the origins of dreams and the effect of dreams on the exterior world and, you know, whether or not God exists. Like these are preoccupations, not just of poets, of course. So it's interesting how, yeah, these little snippets that feel like they're very much about poetry or the act of writing a poem are also applicable to so many things outside of the world of poetry too. Do you feel like with these poems, like something that um, I find about these poems is that there is this existential curiosity to them. And this is something where I feel like maybe my own personal background leaves me a little bit unprepared just because I didn't grow up religious. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there is a lot in this collection where religion is very, very front and center. Um, either in the imagery or some, just like there is something, use the phrase God haunted earlier. And I'm not very well equipped to, um, I'm not sure if receive is the right word for that, but you know, like I have my own existential quandaries and curiosities as well. And there Mm -hmm. are ways where that's happening in this, that are ways that feel accessible to me. The religious aspects are a little less so, but I feel like, Mm. again, these are things that are important to the poet. I almost feel like I wonder if there's a way in which for somebody like me, the sort of more secular philosophical aspects can be a little bit of a doorway into the religious philosophical aspect. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, there's, there, there's definitely something that I find Mm. interesting about the religious aspects of this, but I I wonder how they uh, read, how they hit to a person who shares that background. It's entirely possible that her poems and lines that wrestle more overtly with ideas of God or Christianity uh, resonate more um, with me as someone who did grow up, you know, reading a lot of the Bible and you know, whose own work wrestles a lot with the legacy of those beliefs. I know that Kelly, you know, grew up Catholic. Um, I don't know what to, to what extent she remained Catholic outside of her childhood, but I know that she was interested in troubling it or or wrestling with it. (laughs) I love this line from the white pilgrim. I know your works, God said, and that is what I am afraid of. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like there's a humor in some of these poems too, even in regards to things like God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I wonder if, you know, for, for someone who didn't grow up religious or, or thinking about God much, if there's a way that, you know, applying these ideas to really anything you were taught growing up about how the world works or about good and evil about tenderness and cruelty about these themes that run through a lot of religious stories and ideas, but aren't relegated to them. If there's a way to apply really any notion of authority or right and wrong to mm. some of these things, I'm not sure. Yeah. Cause I, I definitely do connect with it as, as someone who grew up thinking a lot about God something that I've been thinking about, this is actually something that's run through several of the conversations that I've had on the show recently. So I talked with um, the poet Kazim Ali recently about his poems, which ha- engage with divinity in a way that I feel like I don't see a ton in contemporary poetry. And he's coming at it from a number of different angles, whether it be sometimes more secular and sometimes this sort of syncretic combination of multiple religious traditions, which I found really fascinating. Recently, I talked with my friend William Henry Morris about Sophia Samatar's short stories. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there's a lot in there about, uh, in particular, the collection we were reading together has a story that is 
sort of Mennonites in space. And it's one of the things I found fascinating about it is that it, it is in some ways a critique of certain aspects of Mennonite culture, but it is also done in a very personal and sort of familiar kind of loving, longing kind of way. I feel like so much of art and literature, not just poetry, but including poetry, contemporary art and literature is very self-consciously secular. And I'm not sure this is necessarily true before, but I feel like when I was first learning anything about poetry, like in high school in the 90s or in college in the early late 90s, early 2000s, that there is this sort of way that religious art is seen as either historical or, if contemporary, not serious. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this collection, I don't know what it was like, what the atmosphere around that kind of thing was like when she published this, which I guess was in 94. But, you know, like so much of the history of especially poetry, especially Western poetry, is so rooted in the religious and in Christianity, especially when we talk about European and English poetry. And if like somebody like John Donne can talk about God and religion, then why can't somebody like Bridget McGean Kelly or somebody mm -hmm. now? I don't know if I'm saying it quite right, but there is something that feels interesting to me about this question. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. It's reminding me of when I was in school studying poetry and I had a professor forbid me from using the word God in any more of my poems. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's definitely a, or has been at least in some academic spheres, a, a real resistance to writing into ideas of religion and religious belief. But I do think that's changing quite a bit. I think many celebrated poets right now are very interested in ideas of faith and devotion. I've, I've noticed so much brilliant work coming from Black queer poets in particular or, and thinking about ideas of, of queerness and sex and the body through these lenses of devotion and faith and legacies of Christianity and Christian iconography. And this work is stunning. And this work is, you know, being read. So I'm, I'm excited by what feels like an opening, less resistance, just kind of in general to that terrain of human thought and experience. Uh, it's a bummer that for a long time, it was um, in such bad taste to even, mm. you know, attempt. But also maybe that was necessary. Maybe, you know, Christianity was bearing down so stiflingly on art that it needed to kind of totally repel it for a while. But yeah, I'm I'm glad that so many contemporary poets are are wrestling with ideas of faith and religion right now. I mean, I, I, I think that thing that you just said about it stifling perhaps, like you know, like I feel like there's something about the act of creating art that can't help but be reacting against something, you know? Yes, absolutely. I mean, most of us, if we're being intellectually honest about the world and society and culture and all of these things, that there are things about religion, about any religion that are stifling or mm -hmm. that can be authoritarian or things like that. And so this, it being such a dominant force in the world for so many thousands of years, if we want to tell truth, then maybe we'll set ourselves against that. But maybe mm -hmm. if we are fully setting ourselves against it. I mean, it's hard to engage with the world as it is if we don't allow a certain interrogation of both sides of that question. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to to wrestle with something, you have to involve the thing, you know, in a way. <laughs> like you like one way of, of reacting to the pressure is to, you know, kind of flee from it. Um, but the other is to kind of meet it head on and try to push it back. And in that second case, yeah, you have to, you know, if not name the thing, uh, you know, wrestle overtly on the page with it. I think art really is, you know, so often a result of responding to pushing back against. It's a pressurized art form, poetry, I think, in particular. I don't get the feeling, though, that Kelly, in these poems, she's not unwilling to interrogate certain ideas to 
question, right? She's, she's certainly not willing, Mm -hmm. not unwilling to question, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, I also don't get the sense that she's writing from a place of just outright rejection either. Mm -hmm. And I think that that sort of in between those two poles of neither wholly accepting nor wholly rejecting is perhaps the most interesting place that an artist can live. Amen. Yeah. Dwelling in that messy in-between state really feels like the only place that truly interesting work can happen. And maybe particularly poetry, it it very much resists easy answers, either ors. It's really where the magic happens when you can lean in and dwell in the not knowing, in the the maybes, in the sometimes is, in the like, to this extent. Um, And I I love that she's willing to dwell in that space intellectually and spiritually and to conjure that experience in a way that, like, yes, it can feel somewhat impenetrable and mysterious, but there's something tangible about it that she's evoking for us, or evoking for me, at least, even when it's at its at most messy and sort of unknown and mysterious. There's at least a musicality that's pulling me through or some vivid imagery that's pulling me through or some repetition that's enacting some sort of trance-like state. Um, There's something. She's giving me something. um, And I'm just so grateful for that. So I think we're getting pretty close to time here. I want to make sure if there's anything that that you wanted to get into that we didn't already talk about. Oh, I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity to talk about this book that's so important to me. And you know, there's something about her legacy that's really important to me to keep alive. You know, she died in 2016 and she was such a private, humble person that sometimes I worry not enough people will remember her work or read it or teach it. And so I appreciate any opportunity I have to dig deep with someone else about this work because I think it really is so unique and and so important and i want anyone else like me who needs to encounter it to be able to encounter it so i really appreciate this conversation a lot and i'll be thinking about so much of of what you said and your insights about it for a long time so thank you well likewise you know one thing i i just sort of talking about how she was a private person is you know when i was trying to research for this conversation there there were questions that i had about like like maybe this poem feels like something that somebody would write if they had lost a child mm-hmm. for example or this poem feels like something that somebody would write if they had had this experience and i and i would go and i would try to find like did she did she have a miscarriage at some point did she lose a child like and there's just nothing no information that you can find about that kind of thing but what i did find that i thought was interesting is that the people who talk about her like for example i i in order to try and find out a little bit more about the circumstances of her life i i looked up to see if there was any obituaries of her and there were actually like a ton of them written by people who had just loved her work and that is something that seems to be sort of the common thread about people who i mean even just in you know the, the other day when you tweeted that we were going to be having this conversation later this week several people responded to that with, oh, I love her work so much. And I feel like this is something that she may not be a household name quite, but the people who do know her work seem to really, really love it. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, if we are concerned about the longevity of the work, that has to be a good sign, I would say. I think so. Absolutely. And I think she was such a beloved teacher talking with a few people who had the opportunity to be her students, they just absolutely glow with awe about her as a person in a way that seems really special and really rare. You know, it's so easy to glorify the author of work that you love when you've never met them. And then often you meet them and it's, you know, kind of a letdown. You're like, oh, you're you're a human being with flaws and whatnot, um, which isn't to say she you know, wasn't flawed. Of course she was. We all are. But um, I've been really touched by the anecdotes I've heard from former students. And I'm so glad to hear that her spirit as a person in the world had a, a capaciousness and a generosity um, and an attention 
that I can feel good about uh, supporting, mm. you know? Um, <laughs> and isn't it wild how, I mean, there's no interviews with her, not a single one out there. There's one recording I found of her reading one poem and it's the last poem in this book. I wonder if there's any way for you to like get permission to share it in your podcast or something, but there's just nothing. There's just so little known. And so we really do have to return to the work itself. That's the gift that she left us. Yeah. Well, so there's one question that I always like to end with, and that is if there is a piece of art or literature or creativity in some form that you've experienced recently that meant something to you. Obviously this book would be one, but um, if there is something else. I've been so immersed in this particular book. It's hard to think of anything else right now, to be totally honest. Um, it's been so all consuming <laughs> the last two days and getting ready for this conversation, but I, I really appreciate that question. It's probably just um, that this book is so emotionally loud for me it's hard for me to even like like I'm thinking of other things but compared to this you know what really is it <laughs> um I was you know returning to which is rare for me but um returning to some more like critical theory texts about photography and imagery recently so Berger's ways of seeing stuff like that that um you know I find thought-provoking and I'm enjoying thinking about um but in terms of like meaning something to me, like touching my heart, um, I'm just going to stick with song for now. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, <laughs> it, I, I can definitely see why it would be the one to sort of overshadow anything else. It is a monumental work for sure. Yeah. Maybe I can throw in her other books because I was looking at them again too. So <laughs> <They're> <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time and talking with me. I had a really great time talking about this book. And thank you again for introducing me to her work. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me and for being open to reading a poet who you'd never encountered before. That's brave. Okay, as I mentioned at the top of the show, there are links in the show notes where you can purchase a copy of Song. And of course, I also always recommend buying from your local independent bookstore. There are also links to Gabby's website and to The Poet Salon, the podcast she co-hosts with Luther Hughes and Duji Taha. Do check those out. And that is our show. Editing and mixing on this episode is by me. The music is by Poddington Bear. And transcription help on this episode is by Shea Aguinaldo. I'd love to hear your thoughts about song, about my conversations with Gabby, or really about whatever you'd like to tell me. You can find me in the show on Twitter, at Channel Open Pod. I'd love it even more if you shared the episode with someone you think you might enjoy it, and if you happened to tag the show in your social media posts, even better. If you're enjoying these conversations, please help out and spread the word. You can find all of the rest of the show's social media information, email newsletter, show notes, and transcripts at keepthechannelopen.com. Next time... I'll be revisiting my 2016 conversation with photographer Ken Rosenthal. That will be coming on March 24th, so do be sure to come back for that one. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. Uh-oh.